senior high school students that had the projects that I did not get a chance to see. You're in lab coat, so tell me a little bit about you. What, what's your name? Michael, Ellie, Josh, Sean, Kaya, JD. Now you all do the project, the same team? Yeah. Who's the spokesperson? <laughs> three of you, I don't have time for three. Who's going to be teaming? Come on up here. Introduce yourself and tell us about your project. I don't, I haven't seen it. And I'm not, probably not going to get a chance to see it. So I want, you're going to station, right? Okay, and David Miller back there, you see the guy, he, you talked to him earlier? Yes, I talked to him. He wants you at MIT. <laughs> I, 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 I am not recruiting to MIT, okay? But he told me that he met a bunch of future MIT students. So you get a, so that other people here, because there are people here who just happen to wander in off the street, and uh, some that came down just to go to the beach, and somebody said, well, the bus is going to see a rocket launch before you go to the beach, so come on over. Tell them in a few quick words about your project. Uh, the project is called Artificial Ear, and in this experiment, we are growing crystals that come from this powder called calcium sulfate hemihydrate. This, um, these crystals that grow are the crystals that humans have in their ears that will give you your sense of direction. And we got the inspiration from a NASA project where some jellyfish were taken on one of the missions to the moon. Some jellyfish were born in microgravity and when they came back, they were in sort of a state of vertigo that was permanent. So we're seeing if these crystals that also give them their sense of direction will affect um, our sense of direction as well. Like if these crystals grew so large that it just fit the pocket that they were in, that it couldn't move. So this could affect if humans were born in space, would they also have a sense of direction? Awesome. You know, when I was in junior high school, I was doing volcano. You know, you put a can and paper mache and baking soda and stuff, and psh, that was a very elaborate science <laughs> So I guess, as my son once told me, gone are the days of the volcano. So I used to always describe them as rocks, but they're, what, tell me again what kind of crystal? Um, calcium sulfate hemihydrate. So when you float around and gravity's gone and they don't act right, you don't know which way is up and down. Yeah. Ah, okay. Now, where are the, the social folk? All right, everybody know what this, does anybody have a clue about the social people that aren't a social person? <laughs> Who's going to be the spokesperson for the NASA social people? Just not all that, there you go. Tell them what you do, who you are, where you're from, because you're from all over the place. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have come from... How far? All I'm ever. from Nebraska. Uh, we have people here from Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia. Jersey. Jersey, thank you. North Carolina. Um, North Carolina, we're here from all over the place. So, um, you know, we are here to basically represent the social media. Um, we have, we're attached to our cellular devices, <laughs> our, you know, computers. Um, you know, all of our equipment is coming around with us everywhere. Um, we've been touring for the last three days. Uh, got to see a lot of um, a lot of the insides of NASA that not a lot of you get, you know have seen. So we feel very blessed by that privilege to do so. It is definitely a privilege. So um, I think I can say for everyone that we thank NASA specifically for having us here, um, and of course for being here for the launch today. Do you have any questions? Uh, I, I, you run the room. See, I'm, I'm, I'm stalling for time because they ask me questions if I, if I, don't, if I don't let them talk. So I, thanks very much. Thank you. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, how do people follow okay. you? Okay, so if you are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, right? So we are all carrying the hashtag NASASocial uh, for today. It's also hashtag Orb2. Hashtag NASA, what am I missing? That's it. What's that? That's it. That's okay. it. Okay. So I usually I try to get out and spend a few minutes with the NASA social folk and I usually try to get around and see the students that have experiments. I apologize because like I said, I didn't get to see your experiment, but I'm really excited about it and hearing results once you get back from station. But um, to the for some of you, you know, NASA for a long, 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 long time, even to now, uh, we don't do very well telling our story. That's we have a big, we have a big challenge, and um, you know, we've got Carl Walls back there in the back, who is an uh, an astronaut, 
now with orbital sciences and uh, it's a challenge to get people to understand who we are and what we do and we have such a great story to tell and, and we struggle with it for now 50 plus years um, wow we got a lot of media folk here I even see Marsha Smith back in the back Frank Mooring over here these are all believe it or not they're my friends <laughs> okay right Frank Right, Marsha? All right. There are also our critics, which is good. You need it. It's, it's the fourth estate, and we really need it. But we weren't doing a very good job of talking to Marsha and talking to Frank and being able to get the word out about what NASA does. And then all of a sudden, people like Sarah Rebecca Ramsey back there, raise your hand, Sarah. Sarah Rebecca Ramsey back there in the back came to work for NASA, and, and there, you can tell she's a lot younger than I am. And she started talking about tweeting and Facebook and this kind of stuff and so rather than just say what is that and show my ignorance I just said go do it and so now what we do is for almost every NASA event whether it's a launch uh, a, a symposium or something we try to invite people in from all over the world to be quite honest and depending on the size of the event uh, sometimes we get people from all over the world who come out to tell our story in their own words and so for some of you like the lieutenant governor and his wife were over at the briefing we heard, had earlier this morning, my message to the social media folk and to the kids is always the same. Tell the story the way you see it and feel it. Uh, don't, try to, don't try to sugarcoat it. Just share your experience with the rest of the world. Uh, we now talk to millions of people. I mean literally millions of people that we never reached before until we got the social media crowd to come in and be a part of the family. And they are a part of it. They're a very important part of the NASA family. Um, and, and the work that you all do, again, as I've told you before, when you've come out, is just incredible. Because you've, you've extended our, our breadth, the breadth and depth of our reach. And we really appreciate that. So um, as I tell them and for the rest of you, when you get away from here after having seen this thing leave the planet, and that's <laughs> the one thing I always try to get people to understand. This is a big deal. You know, it's no, it's not as big as a space shuttle or it's not as big as an Atlas V or whatever else. But it's doing something that, not, that doesn't happen very often. This thing is leaving the planet. And it's going to a place where human beings happen to be living and working that is not on this planet. You know, people don't all live on this ball that we call Earth anymore. Hasn't happened for, you know, since the 60s. Since President Kennedy said, you know, before the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. We have been going to space. Human beings have been going to space. And President Obama challenged us when in 2010. He said, look, I want humans on an asteroid in 2025, and I want humans on Mars in the 2030s. And NASA's working diligently to make that happen. That is, neither of those are easy things to do. Leaving this planet, as you will hear and feel today, is not an easy thing to do, but we love it. Uh, we love the challenge, we do it, not because it's easy, but because it's hard, to kind of paraphrase one of the greatest presidents of this country. So enjoy yourselves today, really suck it up, and, and, and let yourself go. Uh, you know, if you get emotional, that's great. If you laugh, if you scream, if you cry, uh, if you close your eyes because you don't want to look anymore, I don't care. <laughs> but just be sure that when you finish, you tell somebody about it and tell somebody the experience you had. So I think I've overstayed my welcome, but uh, Sarah, do I have time for a question or two? Go for it. Yes. Okay, yes. It's more of a statement than a question. Okay. This facility has been unbelievably graceful and gracious. Yay. The employees of the and we have seen lots of very individual jobs that do very specific things and the pride that they have in the work that they do in their piece to this enormous enterprise is breathtaking. The pride that they take in the job that they have and the grace with which they do it and share what they know and what they do with, with us has been incredible to see. Well, I'm glad you had an opportunity to tell them because I try to tell them. <laughs> I know it was supposed to be a question. It makes, it makes a lot of, some would coming from you, so thank you very much. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Before I run, Marsha Smith, introduce yourself, tell people who you are. Marsha Smith, spacepolicyonline.com. So both of you and Carl would like to communicate to everybody about the importance of the milestone we just passed in 5,000 days on the space station. Ah, Carl, you want to hit it first? The importance of the milestone of the 5,000, 
passing 5,000 days on stage. Well, you know, I, so so I I flew on the station back. Uh, I think when volcanoes. Yeah. But I I was uh, I trained with the first crew, and of course they uh, came to the space station in uh, November of 2000. And we have had people on that station, three, and then uh, we were down to two uh, after the Columbia accident. And now we have six since, I think, 2009. And it's a, it's a tremendous milestone to be able to keep people alive, keep them supplied, keep them doing the incredible science that they do up there. And so 5,000 days, that's amazing. is that you, you need to keep everything in perspective. Uh, how many of you read a newspaper? Or, or news online? You know, everybody's... It, 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 it's sort of... If you just look at the papers and news and stuff, you'll think the world's really bad. Or the world's in bad shape. Uh, I like to say the significance of 5,000 days on orbit with people, okay? For more than 13 years now, humans have been living and working in space on the International Space Station. Not a second has gone by in those 5,000 days plus that we have not had an American and a Russian at least working cooperatively in space aboard the International Space Station. Uh, we have all kinds of crises of people down here on Earth. Uh, but the International Space Station represents a model for the way that human beings should and can work together when they're focused on a mission. And that's the way the crew is. If you look at, uh, you know, at, at, at the astronaut from Germany, Mr. Gears, and you look at, uh, at Steve Swanson and, and, and um, the other crew members, we've got three Russians, two Americans, one German. Uh, they fought through the World Cup. Uh, you know, uh, Gerst, and, Gerst and Swanson and, and Weissman, uh, two Americans and a German didn't kill each other uh, after Germany beat us in the World Cup. Of course, Steve and, 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 and Weissman shaved their heads. Uh, that was the bet. Uh, you know, the Russians went into Georgia a number of years ago. Uh, we didn't stop talking to each other on the International Space Station. So I, that's too much to say, but Marsh, I think that is the, that is the real significance of 5,000 days plus uh, living and working in space with people who are from different cultures that sometimes we don't understand, uh, sometimes places that we don't understand. And um, the big benefit of having all of you here is that you get an opportunity to watch today a Ukrainian rocket with Russian rocket engines and an Italian module uh, take American stuff to space. And that's the way it ought to be. So with that, maybe one more question and then I'll leave. Significance of inspiring these next generations and the significance of providing them the opportunity. The question was the significance of inspiring the young people here. Um, it, it is really important, but I think if, if you want to understand why it's important, how many of you were inspired when she got up and talked about this project? <laughs> so, you know, it's been, it's, it is, it's really being turned around. What what you call inspiring them, I think, is freeing them up to inspire us. It's giving them the opportunity to see and do things that they otherwise would have never had a chance to do. Uh, to stretch their... Who would have... How many people in, in seventh grade? I'm just thinking about my time in seventh grade. How many people in seventh grade even knew why, you know, you knew up from down? You didn't care. And, and, and here you got six junior high school students that are curious to know why do we know what's up and down? And why is it that astronauts always complain about not knowing up from down when they go to space? What, what makes that happen? And that's what she's talking about. That's what she was explaining to you. You know, we send animals, jellyfish, frogs, all kinds of stuff to space. And over time, everything that's gone to space has adapted. Whether it's a honeybee that learns how to do its hive in the weightlessness of microgravity, or whether it's people who learn how to ignore the fact that they no longer recognize up and down and night and day don't mean anything because it comes every 45 minutes. You know, when you're going around Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, you see 16 sunrises and sunsets in every single day. 
And every single one, the important thing is, every single one is absolutely incredible. Every single sunrise and sunset is mind-boggling. You know, when you wake up and you look out the window, if it happens to be a sunrise, it's black dark, and all of a sudden there's this little bitty light kind of coming from behind the, the earth, and all of a sudden it explodes and the sun's up. And it happens just that quick. And then at sunset, uh, you know, you see the light kind of go away, the sun dips behind the planet, and all of a sudden it's gone, and it's like somebody being in a dark room with one candle, and they blow the candle out and it gets black dark again. So that's, that's the experience that Carl and I have been blessed to have, and we just think it's really important to pass that on to them because we want them not just to go to MIT, I'd like to have some of them go to the Naval Academy. And Carl, <laughs> Carl would like to have some of them go somewhere. West Point, yeah. You know, but, but that's it. So thanks very much, and thanks for what you all do. Okay, thanks very much. Have a good time.